Hey, everybody. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Dan Schoenbrunn, and I am a film outreach lead here at Kickstarter. Thank you guys all for coming out tonight. This is 201. So how many of you guys were here for 101? I can't even see you, but good. All right. So this will all make sense. We're not going to talk about the basics. We're going to talk about the mid-level, I guess, um, which is uh, audience engagement. So you've launched a Kickstarter campaign. Now how do you make sure that that campaign isn't a tree falling in the woods? Um, you all have built your great camp campaigns. How many of you guys, just so I know, have done campaigns before? Oh, wow. OK, so cool. You guys have been through the fire. And you know we're going to do questions at the end. But if there's anything urgent, feel free to put your hand up and hop in. And you know I definitely want this to be a conversation with everybody. Um, you've built your great campaign. So everything we just talked about in 101, you've recorded uh, a really compelling, fun, interesting, engaging project video. You have set up enticing rewards for your film that really speak to your audience. And you have uh, planned and queued up and are sending out great project updates, sharing content, exciting things that have to do with your campaign. Now it's time to get the word out. And that's a shot from a short film called Afronauts that I really love. Um, and I just thought it worked because like, now you guys are in your spacesuits and you're uh, hopping out into the uh, unknown that is the internet. Um, so uh, this next thing we're going to see here is going to look a little scary at first. Um, and it might look like homework. Uh, this is something that we put together that is a very simple kind of like Mad Lib to get you thinking about outreach. Everything that we're going to talk about applies to Kickstarter campaigns specifically. But really what we're talking about here is just general concepts of outreach. So I think the first question you want to ask yourselves when it comes time to think about how to get the word out about your campaign is this. What communities are going to love your film? Um, and the, what you want to do there is really think about the niches involved with the film. The example I love to use for this is a film that was on uh, Kickstarter last year that premiered at Sundance called Obvious Child. I don't know if you guys saw this film. The film was actually produced by Elizabeth Holm, who worked here for many years at Kickstarter. She was a really, really an expert at all of this um, and knew that that was a film that was going to appeal to a lot of different niche kind of groups, including people who were engaged in the pro-rights movement, because it's a film about a woman having an abortion, comedy fans, because it starred Jenny Slate, and feminists, because this was a film that was kind of like refreshing in that it had a female lead and really was kind of like a comedy driven by uh, you know women, which you don't see very much. So she knew that people were going to be excited about that. So once you've identified your kind of audience segments, you can do this. Um, that first thing there you want to say, feminists will be excited about my project because blank. Really think about what the hook is for your film to each audience. Um, you know, this isn't just because it's a great film. This is because, again, we don't see enough female-driven comedies. And that's what feminists are really going to love. So that's really the message you want to message to that audience. Um, of course, I should mention that like, one, of, one, one community that you will have that you know, I think is the most common thing that we talk about on Kickstarter are friends and family. Right? We all have friends. We all have family. That's typically what we think about at Kickstarter. So make sure to include them when you're doing this work. But try to take it outside of that as well. Um, so once you've kind of identified your niche groups and identified your hooks, it's time to start thinking about like who you're going to tell. You want to think, who are influential people? Where are influential places? And that could be like, you know, an organization that's engaged in the pro-rights movement. That could be a um, bike shop, if your film is about bicycling. Um, or, and then who, where are the influential websites? So again, not just general websites that are going to care about my film in general, but Who's writing about comedy on the internet? Who's writing about the pro-rights movement on the internet? Um, and then you want to find a way to reach all of these people and talk to them about the thing that your film is about and kind of message to them very specifically about the hook. All right, I'm going to leave this up for like two seconds, and then we're going to move on, because there's lots of good, less homeworky type stuff to look at. OK, so you're in the process of identifying your audience. Now it's time to think about kind of like where these people are and the different groupings of them. So we're going to talk about the Kickstarter audience, which is, as we've talked about, your friends, your internet, meaning social media, everywhere online, press, meaning you know where people read news and reports and blogs and more traditional press outlets. And we're going to talk about your backers, um, meaning people who've already donated to your Kickstarter campaign and how you can kind of use them to continue to engage and reach new people. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about each one of these. We are going to kind of sh look at some cool examples from Kickstarter, and I'll give you some kind of helpful tips on how to talk to and build in each one of these uh, four groups. So we're going to start with talking about how to engage your friends. The most important thing, which you think would be intuitive, but plenty of campaigns launch without doing this, is let everyone, and that literally means everyone you've ever met, know that you've launched. Um, this is like thinking, like just looking through your Facebook friends, thinking about like, oh yeah, that guy I was on the high school chess team with. Make sure literally everyone is on your outreach list when it comes to your friends, um, and that you're leaving really no stone unturned. I'm going to talk about an example here which is close to my heart because it's a project that I launched on Kickstarter last year. Um, it's called Collective Unconscious. Uh, it's a web series. It's a little bit different than the typical Kickstarter project. Basically what I did was I um, curated five filmmakers whose work I really love. And I had each of them are, each of them are making, they're adapting a dream that another one of the filmmakers has had. Um, it's going to be awesome. They're filming their dreams now. They're going to be super weird, I promise. Um, but what I want to show you is really like the letter that I sent when it came time to announce the Kickstarter campaign, uh, which was my telling the world. Um, so I'll just literally read this aloud. Uh, friends, family, and colleagues, first of all, I apologize for the mass email. As someone who gets a lot of mass emails, I know they stink. But I'm writing a mass email today that I'm incredibly excited about and that I've been dreaming about sending for years. I've launched my first ever Kickstarter campaign, and I need your help. I've brought together a team of five of my favorite filmmakers. Together, we're creating a web series called Collective Unconscious, where they will literally adapt each other's dreams. It's going to be weird and exciting and fun. IndieWire just wrote a lovely article about us. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, the filmmakers are some of New York's most adventurous. I list them in their credits. It's a project that's close to my heart and that's been bubbling around my subconscious for the better part of a decade. Now I need your help to make it a reality. The episodes these filmmakers create will be entirely dependent on the support we get from our community. I truly hope you'll consider supporting us and joining the collective unconscious. If you have the time, check out our Kickstarter campaign for more information and for a video where I do weird things with spaghetti. Thanks, and I hope I see every single person BCC'd on this email soon. For those of you who I haven't seen in a long time, it's been too long. So it took me a long time to write this email, and honestly, it's like a hard thing to do to like ask everyone you've ever met to support you. Um, and I really worked r hard to make this friendly, to make it honest, to make it kind of not feel like just personally me asking, but me inviting. Uh, so really, you know, take your time with this part of the process. Other things to think about when you're thinking about engaging your friends. A lot of people will just not donate, no matter how many times you ask them. So you do have to ask a couple times. Uh, what I found to be really effective was following up personally with each and every person who I thought would be likely to donate. So I would send a similar email that just kind of said, like, so good to see you at Christmas. I wanted to remind you about this campaign. Invite everyone you know to social media channels. That's an obvious one. But like, really keep these friends and family collected in one centralized place where you could message them to constantly. And Facebook and Twitter and all of that is perfect for that. Um, and then convert your closest allies into ambassadors. So don't just ask them to donate. Ask them to spread the word and really think about like who are the people who are involved who maybe are collaborating with me on this project. And have them not just be people who are donating, but people who are then doing what you're doing and spreading the word. You're, you're building an army. Next up is the internet. Um, so we're going to talk about how to kind of like start to break out of that friends and family circle and get a little bit beyond it, which you know is hard to do. Um, but here are some strategies that I've seen. The first and most important is crafting a social media presence, which I just mentioned. So create your Facebook pages. And then make sure you're putting great things on those Facebook pages. Uh, the 70-30 rule, something that I learned um, a long time ago, which is when you are messaging on Facebook, don't just be asking. You should be asking 30% of the time should be, hey, I need help. We're almost to our goal. Give us money. The other 70% of the time, you want to be giving. You want to be showing people content cool, interesting things, talking to them, asking questions, making it a conversation so people feel like they're getting as much as they're giving, basically. Um, so here's just an example of a Kickstarter page for a recent film, which is a horror movie set on prom night that we'll see more from in a moment. Um, but they created this Facebook page specifically for the Kickstarter. You can see that they kind of, in their cover photos, specified it to Kickstarter. Provide great content. So here is an example of that. This is a film called The Viking of Sixth Avenue that I believe George just talked about in 101. Um, this is a film about Moondog, who's kind of an influential cult musician. So what they did, it's not like they had David Bowie and Elvis Costello and Bob Dylan working on the film, but they created these really nice kind of shareable 
JPEGs with quotes from them that they had given in other interviews about Moondog. So this is stuff that people can kind of like pass around the internet um, and reach new audiences that hadn't seen it yet. Finally, finding ambassadors. So we're going to show a quick video here. But this is the same kind of concept, bringing influential people on board that could help with the campaign. So here is one example of that for a film that you're actually going to hear from in 301 about uh, Big Bird. Tim? Yes, Damien. How do you feel about money? I love money. Me too, I love money. Yeah, I really do. I love money. Money's great. I love money, love Sesame Street. Yep. I love movies about Sesame Street. Yep. Yep. If people wanted to see a great movie about Sesame Street, yeah. they should give a little of their money hey, to yeah. a Kickstarter campaign, and then those people making the movie would have tons of money, yeah. and they could make a great movie, right. and then we'd all have great stuff. Yeah. And great stuff might be even better than money. I agree with that. So that probably took OK Go, what do you think, like 45 seconds to shoot? Um, but obviously now there's this great video that like every OK Go fan is going to watch and be excited about. And I know that like you guys all know OK Go personally, right? And can ask them to help with your campaigns. No, it's like it's this is a great example of like a very high profile ambassador coming on board. But again, really think about who the people are in each of those communities that will be known and how you can get them involved in an entertaining way to be able to support the project. OK, next up is press. Press is tricky and press is really um, you know, it, there, there are a lot of Kickstarter campaigns out there. Press is constantly covering Kickstarter, but it can be really hard to kind of break through the chatter and, you know, kind of be highlighted in the press. This is something that really takes a lot of strategy, um, but that I do believe that, like, most great campaigns can do if they, again, think really strategically about it. Um, so here are some uh, kind of ideas and strategies to think about. Um, the first and most important is to research who's going to be passionate about the project. So for me, this was I had five filmmakers involved with my dream project that I was doing. It was Googling those filmmakers and seeing who had covered their previous work. It was really doing research about who was covering films by David Lynch and you know, other kind of like dreamy experimental filmmakers. Um, but it's also then, I'm going to skip ahead to the third one, which is targeting non-film specific press where possible. This is because if there's one community that's constantly being barraged with Kickstarter campaigns to write about, it's the film world, right? There are like so many film campaigns. We all being filmmakers and in the film community are seeing Kickstarters on our Facebook walls and on IndieWire constantly. Um, what is always encouraged is thinking about, OK, but maybe my film, which is also about mountain biking, there's not a Kickstarter every day about mountain biking. So I'm going to kind of like start to think about other press sources. One tangible example of this that I always give is your hometown newspaper. Everybody has a hometown. Every hometown newspaper maybe would want to cover somebody from the local community just launched a Kickstarter campaign. Isn't that cool? So really be strategic about like how you're kind of getting away from those usual channels and again, finding places that speak to your audience segments. And then lastly, personalize, personalize, personalize. I, in a previous life, I was a journalist and I got plenty of emails that were press releases, and those were the first ones that I would press delete on. So really make it, uh, make it personal wherever possible. Here's an example of that. I'd never met this person. I didn't know them. I found them because they wrote a crowdfund this column on uh, Twitch Film, which is a, a great film website. Um, and so I sent him an email that, ab about kind of the Kickstarter campaign. I wrote a little press release myself that I just kind of put at the bottom. Um, and you know, this was, this was my outreach. And that first paragraph is the personal one, where basically, I introduce myself. I say that I love his writing. Um, I talk about why I love the website. Uh, and I talk about some of the films and filmmakers that he supported that I, I know and, and love. Um, and then I kind of go into a, a professional, here's what the project is. I wanted to see if it would be possible for you to cover this. Got a response back very quickly, a lovely guy who ended up doing an article. Um, so you know, this, this is just, there's no rule to these things. But like, where possible, really be personal about it. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about the community that's already supported you. And there's someone to never forget. And actually, this is, I think, one of the surest fire ways to keep a campaign going is to engage your backers. Um, here are some, some best practices for that. Uh, set reasonable milestones to rally them. One of the things that I think is really hard on Kickstarter campaigns is when your goal is $10,000 and you've raised $500, saying, like, we're kind of almost there, maybe. How do you kind of make it 
make it more of a process. And so this is like setting milestones throughout the campaign and kind of rallying people around that. These don't always have to be financial milestones. This could be, let's reach 200 backers by Tuesday. Um, but here's an example from a film called Spa Night that um, they, you know, when in doubt, use Ryan Gosling. Uh, not involved in the film, but uh, they used Ryan Gosling and, you know, hashtag 8K by Friday. I think they got there. Introduce new creative rewards. This is another great way to kind of keep the campaign going. You have all of the great rewards that you have when you start, but something that I've seen very commonly is a filmmaker adding a new exclusive or interesting reward to almost like upsell your backers. So if you've had a lot of pledges at $30, maybe introduce something really cool at $40 and see if, and then message them about it and see if you can kind of get uh, some extra pledges that way. So one campaign that did this well was the Joan Didion documentary that was recently on the site. Uh, which is textbook in general. I would recommend looking at that campaign and seeing what they did across every aspect of it. It was super successful. But these were two rewards that they introduced midway through the campaign. The first is a t-shirt that they had designed um, with Joan's image, and it says democracy on it. This is actually what I upped my pledge to, because I was like, well, damn, I pledged $30, but I really want that t-shirt. It worked. It was $50. Um, and then the last was like super exclusive, which is like a manuscript, uh, original manuscript from one of her uh, screenplays that she had written in the 70s. It was like the original copy. And obviously, that was something that they put at a very high price point. Um, but it went immediately, because they already kind of had the attention of the Didion community. And then to message them and say, now there's this, they were kind of already engaged and activated. Share content that the audience will love. This is kind of similar to what we talked about with Facebook, but specifically putting things together that you know your backers, who again, you've kind of identified where they are and where they're coming from. And then you start sharing content that's really cool. So this is a project called Everyday Rebellion, which is a documentary about nonviolent protest movements. Um, so obviously, they're not good friends with uh, Kim Jong-un and uh, Vladimir Putin. But uh, they actually, this, this, this was part of a, a larger reward that they put together, which was like a, what they called a dictator calendar. They kind of put these things telling you why you shouldn't support the campaign by the enemies of the campaign as they saw it. And kind of these were spread around Facebook, but they first messaged them all the way out to their backers. And then most importantly, everything that you do should be inclusive. Everything that you do should really make those people who have already given and already are part of this feel like they're really helping to make this thing happen. That's the power of the all, in, all or nothing messaging, is being able to say, like, we're in this together, guys. We need to get there. My favorite example recently of this was um, The Honor Farm, which was that uh, horror movie that I mentioned. It takes place on prom. It's kind of like a high school horror movie set in Austin, Texas. I donated to the campaign, and then four hours later, uh, I had a new Facebook update, and it told me that they had posted this on my wall, which was a yearbook entry that they wrote for me and just posted. Um, it's like so cool. I was like, wow, they, I am funny. That's cool. Um, so that really is my very, very quick summary of some strategies and cool tools to think of for audience engagement on, face, uh, on Kickstarter. Sorry. Um, and I know what you all are thinking. You're thinking, dude, this sounds like a lot of work to do. And guess what? It can, it can be, yeah. I mean, it's like, like anything. To do this well and to do it right and to spread the word and really reach far outside of that first segment, your friends and family, it takes time and strategy and being really, really like kind of aware of what works and what doesn't work and dedicating yourself to it. That said, it's work that I really do believe is going to pay off profoundly, not just for that dollar sign of money that you raise, but for the length of this project, for the length of this film, for the length of your career. And so just very briefly, these, to me, are the long-term benefits of this kind of work, whether you're doing it on Kickstarter or anywhere for yourself as an artist and entrepreneur, is exposing the project to the industry. We've seen on Kickstarter projects kind of first making a name for themselves. And again, in a past life, when I was a journalist for Filmmaker Magazine and I worked at an organization called IFP where I curated a screenplay program, I would always Google and find out that the films that had applied were, oh my god, they raised $40,000 on Kickstarter? That's crazy. It kind of does quantify who you are. Um, and to that point, it kind of says, like, if you can do this and really establish that you have this audience out there, in your talks with distributors, in your talks with the world, you're going to have this population of people that you can point to and say they are invested in what I'm doing. Um, it lets you build this kind of like really deep connection with your audience. So it's not just the film comes out and you start doing this work and get, trying to get people coming to see it. You're actually kind of like, again, allowing them behind the curtain, allowing them to be part of the process. And finally, it lets you do this not just for the first Kickstarter campaign, and that's something we'll talk about with Molly, but really lets you kind of 
build your audience from, from project to project. Uh, I, I love whenever I see multi repeat creators coming back with a goal that's a little bit bigger than the goal of their first campaign for their first project um, and are able to kind of like build their career but do it on this platform. I think it's incredible. You know, and so like in summary, what this really comes down to for me is like what's special about Kickstarter is what's special about making films in general, which is we make them to tell our stories. We make them to connect with people out in the world. It's what it's all about when you're funding on Kickstarter, and I believe that it's what it's, what it's all about just in general for us as filmmakers. So cool, that's my spiel. Um, and so let's bring up uh, Molly. Come on up. Um, so very briefly, Molly is um, a three-time Kickstarter creator. Um, she's actually, it's amazing that she's here today because she, she has a film premiering at the Sundance Film Festival in a week. Um, so thank you for being here seriously. Um, let's see. Uh, that was a film called Songs My Brothers Taught Me um, that is a beautiful hybrid narrative documentary shot uh, on a Native American reservation. She also is the producer um, and Kickstarter creator of Fort Tilden, which is a hilarious uh, kind of hipster Brooklyn comedy uh, that should be opening later this summer. Mm -hmm. um, and She's Lost Control, which is a Spirit Award nominated narrative um, that premiered at Berlin last year. And it's just like this wonderful, kind of brutal, amazing drama. Um, so do you want to kind of talk about your career and how you came to Kickstarter and kind of like how it's worked for some of these projects? Sure. Um, well, all three projects are vastly different as far as subject is concerned and in a lot of ways audience. Um, they are similar in that they were all first time uh, feature filmmakers and, and women. Um, uh, they were all three people that, uh, or, or each, each project, um, were people that I met at NYU. Um, what else did you ask? So I guess um, when, you, when you decided to launch a Kickstarter campaign for each of those projects, talk about how initially you kind of arrived at your goal and, and arrived at kind of those audience segments, who, who you thought was going to be interested in it? Well, with She's Lost Control, um, which was the first of, of the three, um, the, the director had spent a long time before I came onto the project trying to find financing in the usual way that you would with, with investors, production companies, and was just finding that it was just taking a long time and that, that her, her, um, she was going to have to give up final cut and all these things that she wasn't willing to give up on her first feature. So she came to me and she was like, I just want to do a Kickstarter campaign and whatever money that we make, that's what we make the film for. And I thought that was exciting because um, her script was ready to be shot. She was ready to direct it. And I loved the idea of just jumping in and making it happen somehow. Um, uh, and then with uh, Songs My Brothers Taught Me, which was originally called Lee, um, that project, uh, which well, with uh, She's Lost Control, we, we ended up raising a little over $50,000. And um, I guess I'll stay, stay on one project. Sure. And then, yeah, OK. Yeah. So, um, so finding our audience, um, we, I, we would always, we did, all, we did a ton of work before beginning the process. Um, many Excel spreadsheets with different tabs <laughs> of um, beginning with ourselves. And each, each, each one of us would make our own separate Excel spreadsheet of our, of our own like personal people that we knew, whether you know lists of the closest people you know that you're going to reach out to right away, um, family, friends, people from elementary school, all the way to people from elementary school that you don't talk to anymore, but you see on, on Facebook. Um, and then. Um, we also, you know, a, uh, a list of organizations that we were somehow tied to, whether it was um, NYU or IFP, um, Sundance, or any kind of thing that the project had already um, made its way through, which then helped on helped later on when we were trying to get on the their like critics their 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 top like choice of of uh, projects um, on their site. Um, and then we also looked at like special interest groups, like you were talking about with um, with She's Lost Control. It's about a sex surrogate, and um, so we, the director had already been been um, in contact with sex surrogates um, just during the process of writing the script. But we brought them on not only as uh, one of the a, a consultation with one of them as one of the rewards, but then also that they were then on board to help spread the word amongst their really specific community. Um, with uh, Songs My Brothers Taught Me, when we were approaching 
finding our audience for that. It was also with the idea of, it's, it's all set on a, on a reservation in South Dakota, on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, and we were also looking ahead to our production and that we were going to need the support of the community. So a lot of the work that we were doing during the Kickstarter campaign ended up translating to helping us find support within the community. Um, what I'm else? interested in Fort Tilden, um, just mm -hmm. because a question that I get out all the time in the world is like, man, how do you raise money when, if your film like it doesn't have like kind of a social issue tie-in? And you know, this this is kind of like a fun right, right. Uh, going to the beach yeah. comedy. Um, and so, kind of, how how did you think about who the audience for that would be and how to reach them? Well, we decided to do that uh, in order to get money together to go to go to South by. Um, so we kind of had that um, that push already, so yeah. there was already, you know, it was already in the media. Um, and, and that we raised, we, we made a smaller goal, because it was more just about trying to get, pay to get, get to South By, but um, that was really just to like mm -hmm. engage audience and excitement. Um, and how did we, well, I mean, the, the actors that are in it, even though they don't necessarily, they're, they're, you know, they're still rising stars, <laughs> um, they do have their own community of people. They're, they're both, um, one of them does her own, her own work and she has like a number of Twitter followers. So um, even if they're not name actors and even if, even if you don't have an issue oriented film, everybody still has their group of mm -hmm. friends and family. And then moving from the friends and family into kind of breaking out beyond that, can you talk a little bit about like the social media strategy and you know how, how you attempted to target for each of these campaigns people um, who maybe weren't just part of, part of the already kind of know, aware of you guys and what you were doing? Right. Yeah, because that's the goal. <laughs> in order in order to get like the, the huge amount of money, you kind of have to find that way outside of your circle. Um, well, for she's lost control. Um, we had uh, an executive producer on board um, in, name, in name only and, and su creative support. Um, but he had, uh, it's, his name is Oren Moverman, and he has uh, supporters and fans. And so that was really helpful. And we ended up actually, um, by just having his name on there, uh, people coming to us that didn't know anything about us or, or, or anything about the project, and actually ended up getting a, an executive producer from that. That, um, that then ended up giving us, it was a larger amount of money, so that was given outside of Kickstarter, <laughs> but, um, but and, and someone that we're uh, gonna continue to work with in the future. Um, and then also with that project, we, um, we were gonna be collaborating with uh, uh, Julian Casablancas from The Strokes was gonna possibly be writing a song, but it wasn't sure, we weren't, it, it wasn't positive that he was gonna be writing it. It was, it was if, once he saw the film when it was done, if he felt like it, it worked well with um, what he was doing. And so there, since there was that um, not sure if he will, it kind of like, that ended up kind of helping us engage people because they wanted him to write a song for a film. <laughs> and, I, and I just started, you know, I, I had a Google alert, so anytime that there was anything about Julian Casablancas, I would see where it was, and then, so I ended up finding bloggers that were like making memes out of the, out of the, um, out of the video that had Julian on it. So that was interesting to like find this, this other audience that I would not have been able to reach yeah. otherwise. And what kind of, for any of the campaigns, like content were you creating to spread around? Were you kind of making things throughout the life cycle of the campaign, images, videos, et cetera, that you were sharing out in the community and hoping that that would kind of mm -hmm. find their way to other people? Yeah, with um, with Fort Tilden, the the two writer directors are just so funny, um, and anything that they make is funny. So even just like the thank yous that they made, like they would just take a still from from the film and do like a little bubble of something, writing something hilarious that the two girls in the, in the yeah. film um, are saying, thank you, thanking the backers. Um, with She's Lost Control, we were uh, engaging throughout by articles that were interesting to the idea of the of um, sex surrogacy. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit more then about press and kind of how, how much of that happened organically is just having the campaign out there and what was the strategy for outreach to press? Did you do a lot of it? How did you kind of strategize about it? Yeah, we did do a lot of it and especially with, with um, Songs My Brothers Taught Me because like I said, we were also looking ahead to production and finding, um, wanting to get the word out. 
uh, it was it's it's a majority non-actors. So eventually, we knew we were going to have a huge open call, and uh, so uh, we contacted the same like television newspaper that we would be contacting to have the um, to have the the casting call. So. Um, so any kind of like not only South Dakota but specific specifically Native American. One tip that I'd give from my campaign was that I was surprised, and I'll be very blunt about it. I was surprised to find that like a lot of the press hits that I got, which were incredible articles, and like they're great for your ego because you're just like, oh, they're writing about me. Mm -hmm. They didn't actually lead to much money on my personal campaign, and I know that that like varies very widely. Um, so. What I did there was I kind of like re-strategized. I only had a certain amount of hours in every day to be mm -hmm. running my campaign. And I, I kind of said, like, all right, well, I'm going to stop targeting press. We've got some great hits. I'm going to start like doing more of the like personalized follow-up. So I'm wondering, like, were there similar moments for you on any of your campaigns where you almost like re-strategized halfway through based on what you were, you were seeing? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if the press was really translating into donations, but it was it was showing our uh, circle of people that things were being talked about. And so in a way, then, it was like it, it gave us things that we could then um, make extra posts about mm -hmm. and say, oh, look, they're talking about us. And right. Um, were there other moments throughout where you kind of like based on organically how the outreach had been going or how you had seen people like different audience segments reacting to the campaign where you said like, oh, well, now we're going to really kind of target the sexual surrogacy community <laughs> instead of what we were doing, which was X? Mm -hmm. um, we weren't that organized, I don't think, in the way we were looking at it. We were just sort of, Full I think, I think with all of there, with all three projects, there were three of us working on it, um, and we didn't necessarily take specific areas that we were mm -hmm. going to be working on, um, but it did end up that way, um, where certain people just were sort of led to a different. Right. outreach than others. I wonder, was there anything like unexpected that happened as a result of starting this outreach that like you would never have thought that this person or this community would have embraced this film? Well, with She's Lost Control, like fi finding yeah. an audience that, uh, like this huge Orin Moverman fan base, <laughs> which I, I mean, I know that he's very well respected and we were really appreciative to have him, but I, I had no idea that we were going to end up finding a and how is it? Obviously, uh, songs my brothers taught me is just premiering now, so it's hard. It's hard to kind of like quantify the audience there. But how how have you kind of felt the impact from that audience coming in as part of the Kickstarter campaign, influencing kind of the project's entire lifespan? Yeah, well, definitely. Like with with songs my brothers taught me, people are. Um, it does really feel like a community of people like really, really excited about, about the film and writing to us when we write our updates, people writing back and really excited about it. And, 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 and the nature of that film, all the films really is that like we could not have done them without the Kickstarter campaign, without the backers that, that, that we had. And they were all projects that, that, the, that the producers, the filmmakers just felt incredibly passionate about and, um, and the backers seemed to also. And it's, it's, it's really nice going into Sundance with such a, a like strong group of backers that yeah. feel like they're really part of it. And they are, obviously. Okay. So I think we are going to take a few questions from the audience now. Um, I think we have about 10 or so minutes left. And our, the venerable Owen will, uh, will be our, our mic man. So he will kind of come running up and down the aisle with the mic. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, just to put it in context, what kind of budgets were you talking about for each of the films? Or, you know, your, I shouldn't say budgets for the film, but the campaign, mm -hmm. the Kickstarter campaign. Um, for She's Lost Control, it was a little over 50 that we raised, that we, 50 was the goal. And with um, Songs My Brothers Taught Me, it was 80. $80. Over, $80. <laughs> we raised a little over 80,000. And then for Tilden? That we raised 10,000. But the film had already been made. Were these all 30 days? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the way we think about the timing of campaigns, we always recommend 30 days unless there's a really good reason, and sometimes there are, for it to be more or less. Um, the reason there is that like this whole concept of audience outreach is, I really see it as you have those 30 days to frame the narrative of your Kickstarter project. So 
there is that lull in the middle where it really a lot of these strategies we're talking about of like introducing new rewards or messaging around a smaller incremental goal. Those are great ways to keep people engaged, but anything longer than 30 days, I, I mean, after doing my own campaign, like I could not survive. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want it to be much longer. Um, and then anything shorter, it can kind of be hard to build and sustain momentum. So, something that was interesting that happened with Fort Tilden is um, we actually launched it later than we wanted to. We, we wanted to be done with it before we went to South By, but we ended up launching it a little bit later, so it was happening while we were there, which ended up being a blessing in disguise because then the attention that it got there ended up being that thing that, that like took it over that hump uh, and made it successful. Yeah, you have a question over there. Um, I'm interested to know if your campaigns were 30 days, how much was your kind of like pre-campaign period when you made all your Excel sheets and was that a week, or was that happening while it was launched, or did you spend months prepping to launch? Not months, but definitely more than a week. Um, and also, it would continue throughout it. I would say like two, two to three weeks of, of sitting down and like, you know, from the initial start of just brainstorming and, I mean, well, and making the, the video actually. Yeah, I would say I, we probably gave ourselves a month in total and putting together, at least with, with She's Lost Control, putting together the, the video. And, um, and, then, and then, the, then the three of us like sitting down and brainstorming who we want to reach, how we're, gonna, how we're going to. I think an important thing to think about is also just like how substantial you want this campaign to be. Because like you do have a lot of freedom to define. I'm sure the prep for a $10,000 campaign for Fort Tilden was not as intensive as the prep for an $80,000 campaign for Songs Not Brothers Taught Me. So I would say like, Weigh it all, you know, weigh the, the, the time and energy that, and, that you have to put into the prep with what, that, what a reasonable goal will be. Mm -hmm. did, did you contact press before the launch or after the launch? After. After, okay. Yeah, I was actually gonna ask that about press as well. Um, so you, if you're contacting them while the campaign's already started, is there like an ideal time of like when um, you want press to be writing articles, or I don't know how much control you have in, yeah. in determining when, but like, is there a particular part of the campaign that's like most effective in raising money? We're getting I think the way that we thought about it was that we wanted to already have some momentum going on with the project before we contacted the press uh, so that it would make more of an impact to them, mean more to them. Hi, um, two quick questions. Did you find that the Kickstarter um, the Kickstarter campaign helped you attract outside funders um, after the campaign was over, either through grant applications or different investors? And second question, between, so I think there are at least four campaigns between the two of you. What would you have done differently um, in any one of those campaigns? Thanks. Oh, that's a good question. Do you want to take the first one? I'll take the first one, yeah, that's easier. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, video that, for, the, the video that we did for Song My Brothers Taught Me um, ended up being really, really useful for um, finding investors later because it, um, it, visu it showed visually what kind of movie we wanted to make. Um, so it wasn't just words on a page. It wasn't, it wasn't just a mood book, too, just pictures. It was a moving, um, moving image. It, it showed who the director was. And we and we we got an investor from actually so, someone had read the script and was interested in the script, but it was when he saw the 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 video that he actually really got passionate about being on board. My campaign is kind of like a unique and idiosyncratic answer to um, what I w would have done differently. It was funny. It was like a really interesting learning experience for me, also in terms of my day job at Kickstarter and just like learning about the theory of how what what gets people to donate. My project was interesting because, like I said, it was me and five great filmmakers who all like kind of had their own audience segments. Um, and so, in thinking about it, I was like, "Oh, it's going to be a slam dunk. It's like me plus five others, and they all are kind of running their own Kickstarter campaigns." And we were all pounding the pavement, and like those five friends of mine, like were killing it on Facebook. I think what I saw that was really interesting was that um, almost because no one exactly owned it because it wasn't like Lauren's Kickstarter or even Dan's Kickstarter, it was a little bit harder to get like, that same kind of traction from our own personal circles um, that I had kind of been anticipating. Um, I got it from him because I was like in the video and I, like, I don't know, it, it came from me. But So I think it's like, really interesting to think about when launching a campaign, kind of like, I should have thought a little harder about 
what the reaction would be to seeing it and kind of like the psychology of backers and how I could better appeal to them. Like I wish I had the filmmakers in the project video with me, for instance. Um, but again, that's not necessarily applicable to every campaign. That was just mine. The thing that I would do differently is I'd choose different rewards. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess that's not. I would choose much simpler rewards. I mean, I, I mean, when when putting them together, I always think about like what what I'm giving to a project. Um, I normally don't even ask for the reward. I sometimes do if it's something cool, like like the you know like that, the T-shirt you know yeah. or something like that or a piece of art. But if it's like if it's anything else, I just I, I don't I don't ask for it. But we felt like we had to give people something for their money, um, so I would just make them more simple and freer. Yeah. Good, good news. Three three hundred one is coming up, which is uh, which is fulfillment. Um, so lots more about like strategy around rewards. Yes, and, and budget that in your yeah. budget, your Kickstarter. Um, yeah. One more question. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you guys could talk about uh, the online presence of the film before the Kickstarter. If you had like a Facebook page first, a website first, and during the campaign, if you wanted to, like, where do you want most of the information from the film to come from? On like a separate website or just in the Kickstarter, stuff like that? I, th I, I think we started the Kickstarter. The our Facebook pages before our Kickstarter campaigns, or somewhat like just right around the same time. Um, and most of our, our um, most of our social media was on on Facebook rather than Twitter or anything else, because that's that's where most of our friends are. I think. I you know it's it's there's no rule to it. I think I think that um, with so with my campaign. We had absolutely nothing online about it beforehand because we kind of used the campaign as the announcement of the project. And I think that was effective to a certain degree in terms of like buzz and excitement from people looking and saying like, oh, this sounds cool. I haven't heard of this. And then going directly to the Kickstarter page to learn more. Um, that said, you know, if your project like isn't, and not that mine was, but like an announcement or something exciting, uh, it probably does make sense to kind of like have your channels already in place and already have like two weeks beforehand or, or more, a lot more sometimes if it's a film and press production, invited people on, already kind of been keeping people updated about it. Um, you know, because then you have that like designated group that you can just kind of hit immediately with, uh, with information. Um, especially if your film, if you're thinking about Kickstarter for post-production or distribution, um, having a mailing list already in place, not only of like, again, your chess team and your friends and family, but also of like people that have seen the film at screenings, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like having emails collected of people who are already engaged with the film uh, is, is super helpful, obviously. So that, uh, that's, that's about all the time we have, but thank you guys for coming out to 201. And thank you, Molly, seriously, for coming and sharing that wisdom a week before sundown. <laughs>